Hey kids, give me a minute. Don't stare at me like that. Right. Okay, so just so you people know, I have pe friends here who are from high school, and I have friends here who are from college, and I have friends here who are basically from every stage of my life. Um, I assume there will be a lot of mocking going on this evening, <laughs> which is, of course, exactly how it should be. So, uh, hello. How is everyone? I got to get my reading all set up for me. Awesome. You know what? I can have you ejected. <laughs> I don't know if you recognize this, I'm up here, you're down there. It is really exciting though, it's really exciting to actually, you know, uh, like, so there are people here who knew me when I was like 14 years old and be like, could you like read this for me? Can you tell me if this is any good? Or there are other, uh, or like where I wrote stories where they were characters in my story. <laughs> And, uh, and that was always kind of exciting. Um, I remember in high school, I also did a, a story where um, I murdered off all of my teachers in idiosyncratic ways relating to their personality, which you, you, you can't do anymore. <laughs> I don't know if you know that. That's just not a thing that would be uh, accepted. But uh, at, the time, at the time, the teachers were super into it. They were like, you know, I had like Michael Par uh, Palmer, you know, uh, he, he was the Spanish teacher. He, he came up, he's like, I heard you murdered me in your story. How did that happen? And I was like, oh, I got to flip through. I was like, um, yeah, we dislodged rust from your hip replacement and it went and clotted up your brain. And you'd be like, ha, that's amazing. And then he would walk off, you know. <laughs> These days we get the call, we need to have a talk about John. We're a little worried. He seems a little antisocial at the time. So, uh, and I also want to point out that, um, so I started writing um, stories in uh, my friend Ezra Chwaki's room, and uh, and because he got the very first Macintosh, right? Like literally, I think it was the first Macintosh that you could buy, like serial number 00001 or something. 128K, uh, and uh, so, you know, basically we had, it was a boarding school, and so uh, everybody got their own room except for poor, for poor Ezra, who had, to, had a suddenly had a roommate. It's like, I gotta write my stories and stuff like that. So uh, he is actually here, so the fact that I am here now is due to him actually uh, letting me write on his computer, so. This is all your fault. All right. Now, the next thing I'm going to read to you is also uh, not science fiction, but it does relate to science fiction. Um, there's a, um, a w um, fanzine uh, called Journey Planet uh, that did a, um, did a series uh, that asked people to do a series of articles where they took old uh, topics from, uh, from panels and, and wrote essays about them. And the one that they wanted me to write about is spaceships on the White House lawn. The idea, you know, that old cliche of here come the aliens, they're going to land on uh, the White House lawn. And already I'm like, mm -hmm. um, and so the, the question is, how would it proceed from there? How would they actually, you know, uh, how, is that something that the aliens would actually do? Is this something that, they, would they do something else? And I have very definite opinions about this, so I wrote about this. But one of the reasons that I uh, wrote about this also was, um, before I started writing novels, um, I did a lot of uh, writing for, explanatory writing for science. I did a uh, astronomy book, The Rough Guide to the Universe, and I worked with the Uncle John's bathroom readers to do a number of uh, articles that were about science. And I am a firm believer that 80% of all science is explainable to just about anybody if they actually want to listen. Uh, and I think that one of the things that we really need more of are people who are great science explainers. Um, Folks like, you know, um, obviously uh, Carl Sagan, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, uh, uh, you know, Bill Nye, the science guy, the, the folks who actually go and they make science interesting and science fun and they make it, it easy to explain it, uh, difficult concepts to people. Um, so in writing this, 
in addition to talking about whether or not aliens would come out on the space uh, on the lawn, I wanted to do a little bit of scientific grounding as to whether I think that was a plausible thing or and what I thought was the pro plausible answer to this. So I'm going to read that to you now. Um, it's called Spaceships on the White House Lawn. Oh God, oh dear sweet Jesus, oh great merciful spirit who dwells in the skies, please do not let the aliens land on the White House lawn. Not now, not with this president. We all know how he feels about undocumented aliens. <laughs> he would tweet something nasty about them, piss them off, and then they would vaporize all of this. Either that, or he would try to take credit for their existence in the universe with likely the same result. If I saw spaceships heading for Washington, DC, I would wave them off to Ottawa. These days, Justin Trudeau, Tr Justin Trudeau is a much safer choice for first contact. For the sake of all humanity and all living creatures on this planet, please let them land in Canada. That said, the aliens on the lawn scenario, whether that lawn is in DC, Ottawa, Beijing, Moscow, or anywhere else, is a deeply unlikely one. When the aliens come, if the aliens come, they're unlikely to want to talk to world leaders. I think it's unlikely they'll want to talk to anyone. We might not even know they've come at all. So let's start with one major ground assumption, uh, which is that, that Einstein was correct, and the speed of light is a law and not just a good idea. Science fiction authors have imagined all sorts of ways to get around the speed of light. I have thought of, of at least three ways myself. Uh, but to date, all the scientific hypotheses to get around the speed of light are highly speculative, and the most attractive, i.e. even mildly plausible, involve special types of energy or vast sources of energy which would make them extraordinarily difficult to use. So as a practical matter, let's go ahead and toss out faster than light travel. So our aliens would have come and would have to go th some fraction of the speed of light in their travel, and probably some relatively smallish fractions, not only because the energy is involved in both speeding up and slowing down, but while space is mostly empty, it is not, in fact, entirely empty, and colliding with anything at an appreciable fraction of the speed of light releases a lot of energy and potentially causes a huge amount of damage to your spaceship. Again, we science fiction writers find lots of speculative ways around this aspect or often just alight it entirely, but it's a real issue. In both cases, the larger your spaceship, the larger your potential issues. So let's arbitrarily say that 10% of the speed of light is a reasonable speed for interstellar travel in terms of energy requirements and general collision safety. Also, for now, let's discount the time needed to accelerate to 0.1c and then to decelerate at the end of the, at the destination. In the Milky Way, our galaxy, the average distance between stars is about five light years. For Earth, our nearest neighbor is Proxima Centauri, which is 4.2 light years away. So the average travel time between the nearest stars is about 50 years. This presents a problem for humans, uh, the one intelligent species we know of, which currently has a life expectancy of 79 years. It also presents a problem for most animal life we know of, whose life expectancies are not too dissimilar. It is not unreasonable to posit that any biological life in the universe may also exist within similar life expectancies. Even a creature living in an order of magnitude longer than us would still have the problem reaching and returning from anything other than the nearest star systems. It also presents a problem in that all life we know of is planetary and is designed by its evolution to exist in a complex ecosystem at the bottom of a gravity well. For any life more complex than a single-celled organism to exist in space for 50 years on the short side is a challenge. Multi-generational ships can be posited as a solution, but their complexity would also need to be immense. And in the end, given the intelligent life that we know of as our sole role model, the psychological effects of forever traveling in the dead of space is likely to be immense and probably deeply negative. But let's suppose some intelligent race, us or anyone else, decided to brave the vast expenses of time and space to visit a nearby star system. Would we or they, on discovering a world filled with life and possibly intelligent life, plop down on what passes for a grassy field there and extend their version of a hand to whatever showed up to see them do it? No because we, and presumably any creature intelligent enough to travel the stars, would recognize the inherent danger of that ecosystem to us 
and us to that uh, and their ecosystem to them. There's a reason we plunged the Sp Cassini spacecraft into Saturn's presumably lifeless atmosphere, burning it up, rather than to let it continue to orbit and eventually crash into one of Saturn's icy moons. Because we didn't want to risk contamination of those moons by any tiny bits of life that might have gotten onto the spacecraft back home. The only way any intelligent species would be willing to do that if it was if the intent was to recklessly colonize a planet, not caring what it did to the existing ecosystem. And if they did that, they probably wouldn't bother being nice about it. But it would still come at an immense risk to the invading species. Just ask H.G. Wells. It doesn't make sense for biological creatures to travel between the stars. We are too mortal. We are too squishy, and we are too at risk from both the vast expanses of space and any other biological creatures we might find in our travels. If there's interstellar travel at all, it will almost certainly be by machines. These machines may be intelligent or not, but they will, by the design of their creators, be optimized for space and for travel between the stars. Now, if we accept this premise, and for the purposes of this piece, I'm going to save, ask you to save all your complaints until the end, um, then the question is, what does a machine designed for space need with Earth? And the answer is probably nothing at all. If it's been designed for space travel, then it's designed to optimize energy acquisition in space, which means it is probably solar or scoops up hydrogen and trace bits of matter in the void. It doesn't need Earth, say, for oil. And what about things like water or metals? Well, these things exist in other places, including in our own solar system, where they can be acquired with far less risk of either ecosystem contamination or the native intelligent creatures shooting up the machine in a panic about it stealing its precious natural resources. There is nothing Earth provides in terms of raw materials that can't be gotten elsewhere in the system. So basically, if a spacefaring machine decided to colonize our solar system, there are more attractive places for it to do so than our planet Earth. The only thing the Earth provides is what doesn't exist elsewhere uh, in our system so far as we know, life. We can pause it for the sake of argument that our space machine is curious about life and life on Earth and it might want to know more about it. But that doesn't mean that it will satisfy that curiosity by coming in for a landing and looking about, at least not at first or not for a very long time. What it is more likely to do is what we do when we look at planets, a bunch of flybys to learn the general gross details of the planet and then parking into orbit or elsewhere nearby for a closer look. Thanks to humans' extensive use of radio frequencies to communicate with each other, we are immensely leaky with our information. I posit that our spacefaring machine will spend time gathering information from our transmissions to build a working model of who we are and how our intelligence works. How much time? as much time as it needs. This is a thing that has spent decades or centuries traversing the stars to get here. It is not in what we would ever define as a rush. If it decides to communicate with us, I would argue it's unlikely to come in for a landing. Instead, one way or another, it's going to plug our, itself into our communication systems and introduce itself that way. There are no lawns except virtual ones. But again, why would it introduce itself at all? If it has learned anything about us, then it knows how disruptive its presence would be to us. Not just the holy crap, there's intelligent life out there in the universe besides us part, but also the implications of who and what it is. Being visited by a machine creature from the stars, which took decades or centuries to get here, would confirm there is no warp drive, no hyperdrive, no useful way for us to leave our solar system in our current form. The stars would be denied to us forever. Our, our machines might get there, and indeed Voyager is already on the way, but not us, and that is going to mess with us. But it might finally make us stop treating the Earth as disposable, I hear some of you argue. Oh, honey. <laughs> You forget that when humans get depressed, they go on benders. I posit the two most likely scenarios for this machine traveler dealing with humans is either not to bother communicating with us at all, because honestly, what is the point, uh, or by simply pretending to be one of us in the virtual worlds and systems we have created. All it would need is an email address, a social media account, and some facility with cryptocurrencies. Everything else would follow quickly enough. In either case, the impact on humans and our systems would be minimal. No disruption to society or markets or anything else, at least not any more than any other single person might disrupt them. In which case, the aliens might already 
be among us. And you might have talked to them on Twitter, where they have almost certainly blocked our current president and are chatting up Justin Trudeau. All right, that's that one. Okay, I have one more piece for you, and then we're going to get to question and answer. So be thinking of things that you want to ask me. Um, for this last piece, um, you know the piece I just read you? Forget I even mentioned it, okay? Because um, in this piece, the aliens are out there, and they have this thing that's called the Intergalactic Federation, Federation of Civilizations, and it's awesome. And we see how awesome it is. And we're like, that's awesome. Can we apply to join the Intergalactic Federation of Civilizations? And they're like, well, yes, you can apply. And so we apply. And we get our essays done. And we get our recommendations. And we put all that sort of stuff together. And we wait by the computer to find out whether or not we've been accepted or not. Um, and this is the answer that comes. It's called regarding your application status. <laughs> Those of you with college-age kids will feel the pain right away. Dear humanity, thank you so much for your application to join the Intergalactic Federation of Civilizations, henceforth abbreviated as the IFC. We regret to say that after careful consideration of, by our admissions committee, we are currently unable to offer you admission either as a full or probationary member of the IFC. Indeed, I have to confess, there was serious consideration as to whether we should refer your application to the containment committee as possible evidence of a need to quarantine your planet and sequester your species. But after a close vote, we have simply decided to table the matter and move on. I understand this news will come as a disappointment to many of you. While it is not the practice of the admissions committee to offer detailed explanations of its decisions to reject applicants, I understand that as this is your first attempt at an application, uh, you may benefit from a few hints, tips, and pointers that will put your civilization in a better stead if and when you should ever choose to apply for IFC membership again. So in the spirit of helpfulness and to give you something productive to do with your time, here are some of the reasons committee members gave for rejecting your application. One, you don't have a single viable planetary government. Seriously, you have at least 200 political entities talking smack about each other all the time. It is tiring to hear you squabble. One of the committee members compared it to a nest of lender and malt, which is a comparison that won't mean anything to you, but which means that you are basically all angry and sticky and unpleasant to be around. And even when the blender are done molting, they're still mostly sticky, so take that as you will. Yes, we know about your United Nations. Come on, dudes. Pull another one of our appendages. You really need to sort this out amongst yourselves. Pick a government. Any government. Well, not any government. Be choosy. Sweden's system seems nice. We're not telling you what to do, though. We know you have that oppositional thing going on. Just figure it out. Two, somewhat related to point one, you folks still spend an unseemly amount of time killing the hell out of each other, which strikes many of our committee members as a really bougie thing to do. I think these particular committee members may not actually have a good grasp on what the term bougie means in this particular case, but I think the basic concept comes through. This is not a great look. If you can't control yourselves at home, how are you going to control yourselves in the universe, and so on. Have you ever tried not killing the hell out of each other? Maybe give it a spin. You might like it. We know you're all really good at coming up with excuses about why you really just need to kill each other, but I have to be honest, we really don't grade on a curve with this one. Three, also your various bigotries, hatreds, inequalities, blah, 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 blah. Jeez, you people are terrible to each other. Until you get over it, no one's going to want to hang out with you at parties, if you know what I mean, and I think you do. Look. I don't want to belabor the point, and I know you all really hate being lectured, but you all also kind of have cosmic moral halitosis, and it's just not polite not to tell you. Get some gum if you get my drift. 
a lot of gum, like a pallet of gum. I know, but come on. Number four. Okay, this point is a little bit confusing, but one of the committee members says that you have produced far too much plastic, uh, and another uh, says that you have not produced nearly enough of it. The whole point is you are doing plastic wrong. Pick which way you want to go with this thing, get back to us. Five, you may wish to stop beaming your television shows into space. They're not putting you in the best light. <laughs> For example, one of our committee members said they must be punished for what they did to Gilligan. <laughs> it was pointed out to this committee member that one, Gilligan's Island was a fictional television series, and two, that it being employed as a shorthand for alien civilizations not understanding the concept of television series was so overused as to be both trite and offensive. To which this committee member said, oh wait, did I type Gilligan? Sorry, I meant Jillian, they must be punished for wasting Jillian Anderson in those last two seasons of The X-Files, which is both fair and accurate. Six, your sports make us angry and confused. A small list of specific problematic issues for us include the two-point conversion, the designated hitter, why there is no relegation in Major League Soccer, why the WNBA is not more popular, how the, uh, the in entire sports of cricket and Australian rules football, how rhythmic gymnastics differs in any relevant manner from dancing, <laughs> and why curling is not just called frosty shuffleboard. <laughs> Fix all of these, please. Seven, your decision to declassify Pluto as a planet is deeply offensive to at least a couple of committee members who hail from icy planets. While one of these committee members would be satisfied by the recommission of Pluto uh, as a quote unquote real planet, another one requests that you also launch Neil deGrasse Tyson into the sun. <laughs> Both for being the instigator of the removal of Pluto but also, and these are their words, being so damn literal on the internet all the time. <laughs> I will note that per point two above, the committee member speaks only for themselves and not the entire committee on the member uh, on this matter, but yeah, Neil should maybe lighten up here and there. <laughs> Number eight, you should floss more. When I asked the committee member who made this complaint to whom this was directed, they simply said all of them and refused to say anything further. However, this complaint was endorsed by literally all the other members of the committee. So, well, there it is. And I, also we mean really floss, not just sort of swipe at your teeth. You have to get under the gum line, people. Number nine, this line item is a grab bag of things we want for you to consider and in no particular order. Be kinder to each other, feed the poor, stop heating up your planet, hydrate, exercise a little more, eat meat a little less, put out Half-Life 3 because we think that story is hilarious, give George R.R. R. Martin a break on his writing schedule, canonize Prince David Bowie and Janelle Monet, more pictures of pets on the internet, sell Lin-Manuel Miranda on Hamilton 2, The Quickening, Tell your friends and family you love them, and for God's sake, stop electing so many exasperating, venal, and greedy people. It's not a great long-term plan. 10, finally, you should probably be aware that humanity wasn't the only group from Earth petitioning to be let into the IFC. We also had applications from the cetaceans, the corvids, and a joint application from the cephalopods and the blattodeans, where the octopus and squid handle the oceans and the cockroaches and termites deal with the land. I have to tell you that each of these applications got a lot further along than yours, and not just because they are neither actively warming up the planet nor wasting the talents of Gillian Anderson. Maybe you humans should look at what they are all doing right. Or don't, we're not the boss of you. Just don't act surprised and upset when you're ruled by whales, crows, and cuttlefish. You can't say you weren't warned. So there you are, incorporate these findings into your next application when the IFC opens up for another round of submissions in about 1,200 of your years. Hope you're still around then. Good luck. 
Sincerely, Club Munsub Admissions Committee Head, IFC. There we go, that's the reading for tonight. Um, okay, so now we go to question and answer time, and here's how question and answer time works. You can ask me literally any question you want. Um, you can ask me about um, the books, you can ask me about um, uh, upcoming film TV projects, you can ask me about um, writing and publishing in general, you can ask me about uh, politics, you can ask me about my personal life, you can ask anything. Be aware that sometimes the answer is, I can't believe you asked that question, you are a terrible person, leave now and never come back. As long as we are clear that those are the rules, any questions, raise hands, please, anyone, starting with you. When will something come out on TV from the book? Tuesday, I don't know. Um, <laughs> So here's the thing, so uh, for example, Old Man's War is currently at Netflix, right? And we are at the point where they have, uh, yeah, surprise. Uh, uh, and they, we are currently at the point where they're, uh, they've had screenwriters give treatments and they're gonna go, and the producers are gonna go to Netflix and Netflix will say, go with this screenwriter and we'll do that. Um, between now and then, there are roughly 17,000 places that this could fall into a hole and die. And as context, uh, the first time we sold an option to Old Man's War was nine years ago uh, when we sold it to Wolfgang Peterson uh, and, and uh, Scott Suber. And originally it was going to be at Paramount. Uh, and then that, after about a few years of that, then it went over to Sci-Fi to be a TV series. And now it's over at Netflix where, so it went from movie to TV, and now it's going to be a movie again but on TV, it's a made for TV movie, but we don't call them that anymore because that's not sexy. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but the thing is, so those entire eight years, you know, they would write screenplays, they would have meetings, they would discuss it, everybody was super excited. I got a lot of time to translate Hollywoodese into English, you know, it's like, everybody loves it, it's okay. You know, it's like, we're gonna do a few revisions, it's terrible, you know, that sort of thing. So. Um, what I tell people is the time to get excited for a movie um, is when you actually see it on the screen. The time to get excited for a TV series is actually three seasons in <laughs> when all the producers are like, yes, now I can actually go get my Tesla. Um, so in each of those cases, so and, and Old Man's War is just one, we have several things that are in development, I can't talk about a lot of them uh, at the moment because they haven't been officially announced, but for example, The Collapsing Empire, is with working title, um, and there are, again, several other projects. But, um, and the, it's nice to have a number of projects in play because it's shots on goal, right? But you go in knowing that almost nothing that gets optioned um, gets developed. The good news is, for me, not for you, for me, <laughs> is that they have to pay for their options. Um, and over, uh, over time, that can be eventually be a significant amount. Uh, the old man's war uh, options ha are paying for my daughter's college tuition. So, well done them not making that movie. So, uh, next question, yes? I was curious how long you've been married and how many kids you have. Okay, I have been married 23 years this June. Uh, one daughter who is 19 years old. And here, wait, I'm gonna show you pictures. Here's, <laughs> wait, wait. So this is, this is my wife, this is Christine. And, uh, and all of my friends, the way, I will tell you the story, which is that, so I started dating this girl, Christine, and I took her to go meet my friends at my friend Devin's house, right? And so they met her, and then after they met her, and she went off, you know, to go get a drink or whatever, they came up to me and like, we don't understand. I'm like, what don't you understand? Why you? <laughs> I said, you know why? You know why you? Because I, I learned how to dance. And here's the true story, which is back in high school, uh, there was a dance class, and it was taught by Joan Rohrbach. Uh, and Joan Rohrbach had this dance class that was filled with women, and there were no boys. So she came up to me and she said, my dance class needs a boy, you're it, see you at three. And then she walks off. 
And so I had joined the dance class because you don't say no to Joan Roback. She's a dancer. She could pop off your head with her legs, right? <laughs> and I got routinely mocked by my friends for, oh, you're in the dance class. I said, let's think this through. <laughs> I spend my physical education period moving rhythmically with young women. You spend your physical education being jammed into a wrestling mat by a boy, which is the heterosexual choice. Right? Uh, and so for me, I learned how to dance. And, I, and, uh, and that came in handy when I went to, I uh, was doing a story on a local DJ uh, about uh, at their day in the life of a DJ. And so she, uh, the DJ went to this Marco Polo dive bar and she was shoving CDs into her uh, CD player and doing a mixing thing and there's only so much you can actually watch that happen before you're like, okay, I know what this is about. So I was like, as long as I'm here, I might as well dance, you know? And so I was out there just asking, would you like to dance? Would you like to dance? Would you like to dance? Um, and unbeknownst to me, my wife, future, uh, was coming in with her friends and her date uh, and saw me on the dance floor. And she said, what an interesting and amusing dance style. I must <laughs> dance with that person soon. Um, and then a little while later, I'm standing up against a wall with uh, a, you know, a Coke in my hand, and this woman comes up to me. And I need for you to understand that I was working as a film critic at the time, so I was going down to ho uh, Hollywood and LA on a regular basis, like once, a, once every couple of weeks, to interview filmmakers and stars and stuff like that. So. Um, that was my baseline when I say literally the most beautiful woman I had ever seen in my life was walking directly at me. And only the fact that there was a wall behind me kept me from looking to see who she was coming toward. She comes right up to me and says, you and I have to dance sometime tonight. And I said, now is good. So we got out on the dance floor, and we danced to The Cure's Friday, I'm in Love. Uh, and, and then we danced off and on for the rest of the night. I don't know what the hell her date was doing, but that was his problem. Um, and then as she left, I gave her my business card for the newspaper I was working at, and I was like, I had a wonderful time. Uh, let's do this again. I would love to take you out on a date. Uh, and she says thanks, and she takes my card. And I want you to guess how long it took for her to call me back. Just guess. Three weeks! <laughs> Three weeks! And I was paranoid because I was not setting the social world on fire. I think that's the euphemism I want to use. Uh, and I was worried that I actually gave her somebody else's card and that somebody else was having my date, right? Uh, but she finally calls me back. Uh, and she, you know, three weeks later, which I find out later, she's like, I had some people to get rid of. And I was like, Okay, you know, I, I, I figure that, that the date that didn't dance is now buried somewhere in a bean field. Uh, and, but she calls up and she goes, hi, uh, it's uh, Chrissy, I don't know if you remember me. I'm like, yes, the beautiful brown haired uh, woman I danced with three weeks ago. Hi, how are you? And so we went on our first date and that was uh, June 16th, 1993. Uh, I, on June 15th, 1994, I proposed to her in my newspaper column, because why wouldn't you do that if you could? Uh, and we got married June 17th, 1995, uh, and, you know, and uh, so we have a three-day anniversary period, uh, and we've been uh, together uh, for 23 years, and that's why I was, you had this wonderful, wonderful, awesome woman, and all my friends were sad and alone. So. <laughs> If you want to know, um, how, you know how to meet uh, a woman or a partner, because let's not be, you know, let's not be uh, sis and head about it. Um, learn how to dance; it works marvelously. All right, so that's the answer to that question. Uh, yes, sir. You. What is your name, sir? <laughs> Could you like, dance one? <laughs> so I can do it. See, the thing is, is that I don't actually have shame, so you, that, would be, that would be the problem. It's just like, whoo, it's too. <laughs> so like you put on Mad Madonna, I will Vogue for hours, so. Uh, any questions over here? Yes, sir. Um, are your burritos works improv more, or do you ever plan? <laughs> okay, this one needs context. So I am infamous on the internet and some of you may or may not know, 
for my burritos, and we put the burritos in quotation marks, um, because what will happen is I will take a tortilla and I will literally shove whatever is in the refrigerator into the burrito and heat it up, take a picture of it, uh, and then someone will go and uh, tell Will Wheaton about it. <laughs> And you're like, why Will Wheaton? How does this all tie in? Well, Will Wheaton is a friend of mine. But more than that, he is a burrito prescriptivist. He very strongly believes that only certain things are burritos. Whereas I am a burrito descriptivist. Where I believe that there's the, the difference between, for example, a burrito and a wrap. And this is a philosophical argument. And you can agree with me or not. But if you disagree with me, you're wrong. Um, is a burrito is uh, food that has been wrapped up in a tortilla it's meant to be hot. If it's hot, it's a burrito. If it's meant to be cold, then it is a wrap. Now, you could heat up a wrap, but it wouldn't make it a burrito because it's meant to be cold, so it's still a wrap. Likewise, you could shove a burrito in the fridge and eat it the next morning when you're hungover, and it would still be a burrito because it was originally meant to be hot. Its platonic ideal is hot. So these are the, these are the conditions of state that involve burritos and wraps, and when I explained this to Will, he basically said, you are a monster and you must be destroyed. <laughs> so in response to your answer, they are generally improvisational, because basically what I'm doing is I'm taking the leftovers that would otherwise go bad. We don't, our dog passed away, so we don't just throw things to the dog anymore. It falls to me, which is how, why I have this sexy dad bod right now. <laughs> Um, and, and so I'll just like, okay, leftover Chinese food, some Munster cheese, uh, mustard would be good, you know, and you put it all together and, and, when, and then of course I have to tweet it because that's what, that, that's what Twitter is for, um, you know, and so tweet it and then people just inevitably, you're a monster, how could you, you know, you need help, you know, the intervention is that burrito police are on the way. There's actually a, a Twitter account called Burrito Justice. Uh, which I think has just blocked me, right? <laughs> now, the thing about the burritos is that, you know, in reality, I'm not, you know, I know the difference between a good burrito and the garbage burritos that I eat, right? But it, it's so much fun to rile up the internet and Will Wheaton uh, by these things. And of course, he and I have done panels where uh, we were on the boat, the Joko cruise, a couple of years ago, and it was uh, me and Will and Pat Rothfuss and Mary Robinette Cole uh, all on this panel, and literally half of it was the three of them yelling at me about the burritos, and I was just like, bring it! Bring it, I feed on your tears. And we were, uh, the cruise that year went to Mexico and we landed in this little town called Laredo and they were having a food festival. And some of the sea monkeys, which are the people who attend the Joko cruise, went up to the actual professional chefs and said, we have this philosophical quandary that we would like for you to resolve. And they explained my theory, you know, what I do with burritos and they say, are these actually burritos, is, or is Will correct? And their response was like, look, okay, dude's doing it in, his, in the privacy of his own home, he can do what he wants. If he's feeding it to other people, he must be shot. <laughs> and I think that's a totally fair formulation. I am not subjecting others to my burritos except on Twitter, which is what Twitter is for. Right? I'm not making, I'm not like, you know, it's like, eat this burrito, or, you know, you know, I you put your children at a school on an island in the middle of the, you know, Indian Ocean. No, they're for me. You know, so I don't feel bad about making them, and I enjoy enraging Will, because why wouldn't you if you could? All right, uh, next question. Yes, sir, you. How does, how does one attain spiritual peace? How does one attain spiritual peace? Well, you know, I've actually thought about this a lot. Um, and quite honestly, I have learned that spiritual uh, peace is actually attainable by not, and I, and I mean this in a, in a sort of larger Zen way of not actually giving a shit. Um, and this is what I mean. It's like, for example, um, people in my condition often very, uh, you know, people who are writers, um, often have social anxiety among other writers. Like, who is, who is above them? Who is below them? Does this, does this person's a grandmaster? This person's a newbie? Who, how do I do this? How do I navigate this? How do I meet my, my idols without looking like a, you know, a jerk? Um, how do I, if I go and, you know, spend time with my idols, do I ditch my friends and what does that make me? All that sort of stuff. And I've learned that the way to actually enjoy the company of people 
is not to want anything from them at all. You just don't give a shit about any of that sort of stuff. So like, uh, I, I will meet somebody whose work I really admire. I'm not going to sit there and go, you're so awesome. And can I be your friend? And we, we, we could do so many things together. And I would just, you know, let me share my life story. <laughs> you know, because I want to ingratiate, ingratiate myself to them. And it's like, no, I'll be like, you know, just very much a, hey, it's very nice to meet you. It's cool. And if we have a conversation and it's all, you know, very nice. And if I never see them again, it's great. And if it's, and if I do get to see them again, then we have a basis, which is not me freaking out and them not feeling like somebody wants something from them. Now I'm going to give you a super, 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 super obnoxious example of this. Okay, be aware that this is an obnoxious example and I want you to know that you're gonna roll your eyes when I talk to you about this. So I had lunch with Tom Hanks. <laughs> Here's the thing, Tom Hanks, many, uh, about three years ago, like all of a sudden out of nowhere my, my mentions blow up, I think that's the phrase the kids use. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, it's because people are like, did you see what Tom Hanks did? Did you see what Tom Hanks did? And I'm like, I, why do I care what Tom Hanks did? I, I admire him as an actor, and he seems like a decent human, but uh, there's no intersection between me and him. Wrong. He actually tweeted a picture of red shirts, and he says, this is an amazing book. I can't wait to read every single other thing that John Scalzi ever wrote on Twitter. And so all my friends are like, oh my god, did you see that? Uh, and then, so that was cool. And then I went on a book tour, and uh, my wife sends me, uh, uh, just before I go live on uh, stage like I am now, my wife sends me a text. She goes, I have a piece of fan mail here. And I was like, okay, and? It's, like, it's from Tom Hanks. I'm like, take a photo of that right now and send it to me. <laughs> And they do, and I'm like up here doing like what I'm doing now, and I'm my, being my wife, I was like, hey guys, wanna, I'm gonna read this to you because we can all experience this together. And it was just him saying, I really love your books, this is amazing, this is great. And at the very end, he makes a reference to uh, Agent to the Stars, where I had one small reference to Tom Hanks in it, uh, and we, that he starred in this movie called Gold Master. And he says, Gold Master is my favorite of my movies too. And I'm like, holy shit, he actually reads my stuff, it's not just <laughs> nonsense. And I thought that was it. I thought that was the top of it. Um, but, the, but then, the, but then uh, I get this phone call from my agent. And he goes, well, you're coming to LA, right? And he's like, yeah. He's like, Tom wants to take you to lunch. And I'm like, OK. And the first thing I do when I land in LA is I have my media handler, who's the person who walks me around all the time. And the last time I had been there, um, I was immediately on the phone when I landed because red shirts had just hit the New York Times bestseller list and my agent was like, somebody wants to option it and, you know, and my mom called, you know, so I was like, you know, and I was being super obnoxious and I was like, and I apologized profusely and she was at about like being so Hollywood in front of her and she's like, the last person I drove was a Kardashian, you're fine, you know. <laughs> but so this is the second time that I come and down and there's Diana and I'm like, I have to go to the Chateau Marmont and have lunch with Tom Hanks. Can you drive me there? And she's like, what is it with you? You know? <laughs> and I get to the Chateau Marmont and I'm early. You know, I call up my friend Mike Burns, who I went to junior high with. I'm like, dude, dude, where are, we, where are I am? And he's like, where are you? And I was like, I'm in the Chateau Marmont. Holy shit, why are you there? I'm having lunch with Tom Hanks. Holy shit, holy shit, holy shit. We were just... <laughs> then I go in and, you know, and, I ha and I'm and the, you know, the hostesses are there, and I'm like, I'm here for lunch with Tom Hanks. They're like, Tom's not here yet, go ahead and have a seat. And they're like, so why are you having lunch with Tom? You know, and I'm like, they're on a first name basis with him, that's awesome. And I'm like, uh, he read some of my books and they want to have lunch with me. And they were like, well, what do you write? And I was like, science fiction. They're like, oh, we love science fiction. Tell us more. And so I was talking to them. And while I'm talking to the two hostesses about the science fiction, up walks Tom Hanks. And he goes, what's going on? And I said, I was talking to them about uh, my books. And they're like, we'd never heard of this guy before. He says, you've never heard of John Scalzi. And he reaches into his bag and he pulls out his iPad and he opens it up and he starts scrolling through every single book that I've ever written in my life. He wasn't kidding on that tweet. <laughs> And we go and we have lunch and he orders, he says, I would like to have the, the Cobb salad with, with the lobster. I'm like, lobster, dude, Hollywood's changed you. You know, and you know, we have this long lunch and, and the thing, and at the end of it, and we talk inevitably about business and he was interested possibly in doing something. He says, well, you know, this has been great. 
if you know we go and we do you know something but he says don't get your other and, and i was like literally like dude if we work together that would be great if we don't i've had this lunch and that's enough and that was the, the honest truth because i was there for the experience of meeting this guy who i found super admirable who has done such great work over the course of decades um, and just to be able to have the experience and to walk away from it and not want anything more from him. He, might, he and I are not great friends. You know, it's not like he and I bonded. It's not like I'm going to give him a, a kidney or a lobe of my liver or vice versa. We just had that particular moment. And because I was able to just have the experience of just be in that moment to enjoy the experience, this, uh, sort of fun story that I, even as I was, as it was happening, I was like, I knew that I would be here now telling you about this, um, made it so much better because there was no anxiety about it. There was no hoping for anything more than just being in that particular moment. And if you can do that, um, not just when meeting Tom Hanks or anybody else, but simply in, in the things in your life where you take them, you deal with them in the moment and you, you know, um, the, some things will have consequences and some things won't, but you just sort of free yourself of expectation. In many ways, you'll, I suspect you'll find you'll have a happier life. So there you go. <laughs> but then I'm a science fiction writer and I may be full of shit. So uh, I think we have time for one more question, then we will probably have to get to signing. So uh, I'm going to, you can ask me the question. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes. You mentioned science educators. I decided to read Old Man's War when Pamela Gay uh, recommended it in an episode of Astronomy Cast. She's right. A, she's in a, a, a podcaster, a PhD astronomer. She, yep. she did Slacker Astronomy. And when you said that you had written a book on astronomy, I'm wondering if you crossed paths with her. Uh, we follow each other on Twitter. She seems pretty awesome. So, um, yeah. Okay, I'm going to let you have that last question then, because that was a quick one. So you were talking about your idols. Who are they? <sighs> My mom. Um, no, you know, the thing is, is that it's really interesting when you think about idols in, in the sense of, I have a lot of flawed idols, I think is the way to put it. People who I admire for certain things, but I also recognize that they've uh, done, you know, but th that they're actual humans. Um, and so one of the, one of the things that I've always been very careful to do is not to put people on a pedestal, um, because it's a disservice to who they are. I mean, we've all, everybody in their life, I'm getting philosophical about it, everybody in their life is good and bad. Everybody has grace and everybody has failure, right? Um, and the totality of, of your life is, is, uh, sometimes hard to judge. Um, and so in one sense, I mean, there are people I admire. I, for example, obviously in science fiction and fantasy, um, like I, I like Robert Heinlein as a writer, or I like Ursula K. Le Guin, uh, you know. Um, but at the same time, you know, when, w but at the same time, I also recognize, you know, that not everything that either of them did as artists is something that I appreciate. And in, in some cases, um, some of the things that they have done or said, um, I wouldn't necessarily agree with 100%. Um, and so, um, it's more important for me to recognize that uh, when, I, when I'm thinking of people I admire, to recognize that they are not they are not idols, that they are not people that need to be held up. They just need to be people who you recognize that you can learn things from and be uh, be people that you can respect for their work or for who they are as people. Um, sometimes, you know, um, and it's really hard to do because everybody geeks out. Right, everybody geeks out about the people that they, the, you read a book and somebody just speaks to you perfectly in the book and then you find out that that person was a jerk to somebody you knew or they harassed someone. And how do you square one with the other? How do you, how do you uh, express the grace, uh, how do you appreciate the grace of their work with the you know, depressing reality of, of them being kind of a terrible person? Um, and so this is something that you know I, I think about and I and I deal with all the time. So no, so I don't really have idols. I just have people I admire, um, and that's a really complicated answer to a really simple question. And I'm sorry about that. Um, but 
uh, so we have come to the part where I'm going to sign books, and I figure somebody else is going to come up and talk to you about that. But before they do, I want to do one quick pitch, which is that I know that all of you came and you had to like pay money to uh, see me, which one, I really super appreciate. Um, and two, but two, one of the things that I certainly hope you do on a, on a daily basis uh, or when you come to a bookstore is really show them appreciation because I'm here because this bookstore is here and this bookstore is here because you patronize them uh, in the good way, not in the you know uh, sarcastic sort of ironic way. Um, and uh, if, if for some reason you're here and you haven't bought a book, go ahead and buy one before you go. It doesn't have to be one of mine, but show, their, show your appreciation for this august institution that I cannot believe they actually let me speak at. Um, by by buying a book and letting them know that it's uh, that their their shop is important to you. Thank you, and I'm going to go over here and sit down and sign books now.